So uh, I have with me the today's panel. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Xingpeng She and uh, Dr. Lili Wang from Taiwan. And uh, Dr. Vikash Yerisat is joining us from Noida, uh, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, he works with Jubilant Kemsis. And uh, Dr. Kaushik Das Sarma uh, from uh, University of Derby in UK. He, he is uh, uh, research, he's researching on business strategies in uh, Essex Business School. Welcome uh, and thank you for joining, uh, for accepting our invitation for this panel discussion. And so before I go ahead, I'll briefly give the background of uh, the panelists. So Dr. Shea is a Deputy Director and Research Fellow at Biomedical Translational Research Center at Academia Seneca, Taiwan. Now, Academia Seneca is one of the well-known institutes for scientific research across the world and has the best of the facilities available for drug discovery also. Dr. Shea is also a full investigator at National Health Research Institute, Taiwan. And he is a medicinal chemist by training, did his PhD from State University of New York at Stony Brook. I had an opportunity to work in Dr. Shea's lab as postdoctoral fellow from 2002 to 2006. And I can tell you that he is a great scientist as well as a great boss. Um, the freedom he gives to his uh, students uh, to work, uh, I think that's exemplary. And uh, he has a number of patents to his credit. He has published over 125 uh, peer reviewed papers. And out of that, 29 are in general of medicinal chemistry, which is the best in the field of medicinal chemistry research journal. Uh, his lab is currently working on drug discovery for COVID-19. And uh, I remember in, when the outbreak of uh, SARS took place in 2002-03, uh, he was, his lab was again working on drug discovery for uh, SARS. And uh, uh, I also had opportunity to be co-author on two of the papers. Welcome, Dr. Shea, yes. and uh, thank you for being in this discussion today. It's my pleasure. Dr. Dr. Lili Wang is a virologist and is working as Associate Professor in Institute of Molecular and Cellular Biology, National Tsinghua University, Sinchu, in Taiwan. She did her postdoc from NHRI, that is National Health Research Institute, as well as Max Planck Institute in Germany. And uh, she also worked at University of Basel, Switzerland, before deciding to return back to Taiwan to join Tsinghua University. And uh, her group is very actively engaged in drug discovery for COVID-19, especially the biology and screening part of it. Welcome, Dr. Wang. Thank you. Dr. Vikash Risat uh, works as Senior Vice President, Global Operations at Jubilant Chemsys and Jubilant Biosys. He has worked in several pharma companies that include Pyramil, Zydus, et cetera. And uh, he's a, a pharmacy graduate by training, did his master's uh, and PhD in medicinal chemistry from Gujarat University. Uh, he is also currently engaged in drug discovery for COVID-19 and is also uh, a member of advisory board of School of Health Sciences at uh, UPES. Thank you, Dr. Sirisat. It's always a pleasure interacting with you and thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Neeraj. My pleasure. Dr. Kaushik Das Sarma is currently researcher at Essex Business School of Business, University of Derby. He is a medicine chemist by training and did his PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and then postdoc from Duke and Purdue Universities. After 18 years in pharma drug discovery, 
he and working at companies like Pfizer, Advanus, Jubilant, Nicomed, etc. He decided to change the track and uh, joined Shulni University to start a program on business management, focusing on health and pharma uh, management. And uh, in 2018, he again decided to change the track and move to UK to join Essex Business School to research on international business and strategy. So he has uh, perspective from both the medicinal chemistry and drug discovery mm -hmm. side, as well as the business side. So brings a very different perspective to the discussion. Welcome Kaushik. And thank, uh, you. thank you for accepting the invitation. So before we and, uh, go into the discussion, I will also briefly introduce our university that is University of Petroleum and Energy Studies. We were established in 2003, and uh, we were primarily an engineering and business university initially, but then diversified into law, uh, computer sciences, design, and the latest entry was health sciences last year, and we plan to start the School of Media from the coming session. Uh, UPS has been known to deliver programs which are very specialized. We have a lot of industry interaction. We are working with companies like IBM to deliver specialized courses. And uh, same is being followed in School of Health Sciences also. We started with two programs last year, BFARM and BSC for Nutrition and Dietetics, and are adding 10 new programs in various fields this year, which includes clinical research, microbiology, uh, business management, food technology, which are kind of, uh, I think we started at really apt time because uh, the way the things are going in healthcare world, I think uh, we can contribute a lot to that. Uh, I would like to tell that uh, despite the lockdown throughout the country, um, and we were also locked down, we have been conducting classes online and we have delivered more than 200 uh, regular uh, classrooms during the last one and a half month. Over 10 master classes where people from industry came in, or um, various academic institutes came in to talk to our students on topics which were beyond the curriculum. And uh, uh, we had another panel discussion uh, around 17th of April, which was on healthcare industry. I would also like to mention that in UPS, we do offer beyond the classroom. So uh, we, we have, our students have access to more than 3,800 Coursera courses, free of cost. And also uh, to encourage the girl students, university gives 25% scholarship to every girl student. So, Thank you for joining and uh, we now move on to the today's topic. And uh, Dr. Wang, I would like to start with you. Uh, you being a virologist, there's a lot to understand about this virus. So as we all know, SARS-CoV-2, and uh, the COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is a coronavirus. And there are so many other diseases which are caused by coronaviruses. So what makes SARS-CoV-2 so different that it is so infectious? We had SARS in 2002-2003 also, but uh, that was controlled within a few months and uh, we didn't have more than eight, 900 cases or uh, deaths, I would say. So what makes this virus unique and so infectious? Yeah. Um... To answer this question, I would have to um, give a short um, introduction about this virus. So um, this is an overview of the SARS-CoV-2 and it is a coronavirus. The virus is named by the presence of spike protein, which is the um, orange colored ones on the virus surface. So it because it looks like a, a 
Hero on the crown, so it's known as spike, um, uh, the, the coronavirus. And the spike protein is a attachment site to the host receptor, okay? And the whole viral genome is a positive strand RNA virus, and the genome size is small, it's only 30 kilobase pairs. And um, so in principle, the viral genome can be classified into two major parts. The first part is concluding the ORF1A and 1B, and this area mainly consists of non-structured protein. I will explain what is non-structured protein later, and the half part is structured protein. Okay, and what we have seen on the infectious virus uh, variant mainly consists of structural protein. So that includes the spike and the transmembrane protein here, and as well as the nuclear cap C, which wrap the RNA, viral RNA genome. So these are the basic structure of a infectious viral particle. So that's its called structural protein. And then, the viral genome, the first translation product will be open reading friend 1A and 1B. And this actually has a, a mechanism known as ribosomal friend shifting that gives a rise to two different polypeptides from one single RNA. And the once upon, and this non-structured protein including um, 3C-like proteases, pepin-like proteases, as well as RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So these are, in principle, enzymes involving in viral replication and the reproduction, but these enzymes that are not included in the infectious virus particle. So these are non-structured proteins. So you don't see these enzymes in an infectious viral particle, but these protein will be expressed once upon infection, okay? So um, Dr. Niraj asked what are, oh, okay. So I just explained a little bit about the differences and the similarities between SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. So these two virus share a very good uh, sequence homology uh, between these two virus. They use the same host receptor, which is ACE2, and the attachment of the uh, viral product to the ACE2 are the same spike protein, which share high sequence homology, okay? And the SARS-CoV has a nuclear capsid protein, which is a known interferon gamma inhibitor that would actually affect immunity. For SARS-CoV-2, we haven't, uh, scientists haven't checked whether the M protein affect interferon gamma signals. So another important thing is the R reproduction number of the SARS-CoV is 0 0.4. So this reproduction number is the mean number of additional infection caused by an initial infection in a population at a specific time. In short, one individual may infect 0 0.4 individual at a time. And in contrast, SARS-CoV-2 uh, 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 reproduction number is 1.4 to 2.5. So one person may infect 1.4 to two other individuals. So that caused the spread. And the transmission route is the same the red content, droplet, and aerosol. And the mortality uh, for SARS coronavirus is 9.6, which is higher than COVID-2. So um, by the data yesterday, um, it's around 3.4%. Okay, so these are the basic uh, differences and the similarities between the two. And I would like to draw your attention to a important um, a, a finding is to study the stability, the susceptibility of the virus in the environment. So scientists from, from Dorman have studied um, the stability of COVID-2 and COVID-1 on actually seven different um, environmental conditions, including aerosol, copper, cardboard, stainless steel, and plastic, okay? And in general, the overall stability of the two coronavirus are the same. However, there are differences, include, such as the SARS-CoV-2 actually um, stay longer, survive longer in a cardboard compared to SARS-CoV-1, and it also slides longer in, on top of the stainless steel. The most important part is that you see the x-axis here is 80 hours. 
that indicates that both coronavirus could sustain for days on top of this service, okay? And uh, in aerosol, the half-life of these two are between one to two hours, indicating that the virus could easily transmit uh, through aerosol in the air, okay? So the basic principle to stop the viral transmission is to, by any means, to avoid exposure to aerosol and direct contact. That's why social distance and a quarantine, wearing face masks are so important. And another thing is that the SARS-CoV-2 infection also, uh, most of the patients are asymptomatic or only with mild syndromes. And there are studies showing that the mild syndrome patient also carry with high viral load in their um, um, respiratory tract. So these asymptomatic viral carrier actually increase the risk of public transmission, okay? So at this moment, the, um, in Taiwan, we have a very good control. Um, so we have um, no newly confirmed case in the past six days. So we are doing good. And, but today we have three new, newly confirmed cases, all from imported ones. So in principle, we already stopped the locally acquired cases since the beginning of April. So we are in really good shape. Um, okay, so go back to talk about the therapeutic target of this virus. I will first explain the life, viral life cycle of the virus. So the SARS-CoV-2, um, the infection, the viral entry depends on the attachment between the uh, spike protein and the host receptor, which is ACE2. So the virus N1 is receptor mediated endocytosis, and the second one is membrane fusion. So the fusion is important, uh, either through the release of viral nucleic acid or the escape from endosome. They both need membrane fusion. And upon the fusion, the viral nucleic uh, capsid will release from the endosome and give a rise to the genomic RNA. So the genomic RNA will first give translation to the two large polypeptides, the one I mentioned that encode the non-structural protein. And these two large polypeptides will uh, give a rise to around 16 small ones um, by proteolysis. So here the two major proteases taking part. The number one is the 3C-like protease, and the second one is perpen-like protease. So they just chop these large peptides into small pieces. And these small peptides then assemble into replicates, transcriptase, a large complex. This complex including RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Okay. And then RNA, these replicates, transcriptase complex is in charge involved in charge of the replicating the viral genome as well as the um uh, in the transcription of some sub subgenomic messenger RNA and that give the rise to viral structural proteins. And then the structured protein, including the viral nucleic acid, will enwrap the genomic RNA into the ER Golgi pass, and finally the assemble the virus and then release outside of um, the host cell. So for one single host cell, um, the coronavirus may reproduce more than 100 progeny upon one infection. So it's very efficient uh, viral reproduction. And talking about the therapeutic target, there are actually four major path potential targets. The first one would be the entry inhibitor, which blocks the attachment between um, the spike and the host ACE2 receptor. And the second one would be block the membrane fusion, that including the hydroxychloroquine. And another one, sorry, this is a typo. So there's a, a serine protease known as TMPRSS2 and their inhibitor that could block this membrane fusion. And the third major target are the pro pro protease inhibitors, including blocking 3C-like protease, which is known as also the M-pro of the, of the virus, as well as the papain-like protease. And there are several antiviral, broad strand antiviral inhibitors are um, available to block protease. 
And uh, finally, it will be the RNA-dependent protease inhibitor in case of remdesivir, which is in this category. Okay. So finally, I would like to provide a screening approaches for COVID-19. And the first one, which is the published the first a paper illustrate uh, chloroquine and the remdesivir it are able to block uh, SARS-CoV-2 is by direct antiviral screening. So in this case, the scientists simply add inhibitors to the virus infected cells and to see whether they could uh, prevent the uh, virus infection. So in this case, the, they just randomly add. So with no, uh, the target of this uh, drug is not clear at that moment, but it works. Okay, and the second um, approach, which is more um, um, popular in medicinal chemistry part, is the enzymatic or functional screening. In this case, you have to know a specific target, like in this case, the AMPRO, uh, the three C like protease, the cleavage pocket, as well as cleavable sequence has been identified. So in this case, the scientists actually develop a thread assay. So you have a fluorophore and a cruncher, and you link by an amino acid that is cleavable by the MPRO protease. So upon the interaction between these two, there's no signal because the fluorophore has been crunched. But if you have active uh, 3C-like protease, which cleave the linker, and then you will give a rise to a fluorescent signal. So this is one of the major functional study used for identify M protease inhibitors. And then I would like to mention a most popular one, which is AI-assisted drug design. And this could help to identify either known or unknown drug targets. And uh, um, this is the, um, a paper, a, 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 a illustration of M. Benotovanib AI has identified, use AI approach, identify a drug known as baritinib. And uh, this drug is actually proposed to hit three intracellular targets of the virus of the host. Okay, and, uh, and this drug has entered the late stage phase three trial just now. And then there's another paper, a recent paper just mentioned by Dr. Niraj, is that using um, um, computational approach and identify internatomy of 26 SARS-CoV-2 proteins and identify potential drug targets. So for all these approaches, I think that we are getting in a good shape to hunt for a potential therapeutic for COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wang. You very concisely and uh, uh, clearly explained the difference between CoV-1 and CoV-2, and at the same time, why it is more infectious and what are the different approaches and targets being looked for uh, against SARS-CoV-2. So now moving on to Dr. Shea, uh, you have been working on drug discovery for uh, cancer as well as viral diseases. And uh, you had also worked on SARS and drug discovery, as I mentioned earlier, also in uh, when the first outbreak of SARS took place in 2002, 2003. So what are uh, the approaches which usually a medicinal chemist adopts when such uh, there's a requirement of the drugs Immediately, we cannot wait for 10 to 12 years, which is the usual time for drug discovery. We need something which can e immediately reach the market. So what are the approaches adopted for that? And uh, a related question to that is, uh, since you worked on SARS, um, CoV-1, can those drugs or are those drugs also effective against SARS-CoV-2? If yes, why? And if not, why not? And uh, uh, when can we expect? Uh, so we do have now remdesivir for emergency, but uh, uh, with all the safety assessment and uh, effectiveness, when can we say that the drug would be there in the market? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Niraj. Um, let me 
I'll share the uh, screen and then uh, I can explain a, a little bit. Uh, so, okay, so uh, let me give you some um, briefly in the um, um, idea about the uh, new drug discovery. As the Professor Lily Wang said before, uh, uh, each time when you want to do the drug discovery, the first step is the uh, disease target. You should identify the uh, disease in the target. You not, it's very difficult if you just go for the cell basis screening and then you find the compound. But however, uh, is when you will do the further the optimization without the target, it's very, very difficult to do the lay optimization. So first of all, you have to study the disease study. As the Lily tell, tell us, the, first of all, you should know the mechanism, or in particular in in um, COVID-19, uh, you know the coronavirus uh, uh, virus uh, cell cycle of the coronavirus. So as you uh, really say before, the non-structural protein such as the CC protease, happen like the protease and the RDRP. And then uh, also the structure, uh, uh, structural protein in, is in the spike in the, and the ACE2. So uh, when you identify the disease target, so what you want to do next, you have to have the, the assay development. As the lady said before, the, the, uh, she demonstrated several the, the assay like the CC protease or even the RDRP, they, uh, we will use the Repacom to do the RDRP in the, uh, uh, screening. And then uh, the, uh, also have the build up the uh, spike in the ACE uh, ACE two. So oh so so now the uh, the second step is like the uh, the ACE development. And then uh, you can run like the the high super screening by the uh, robotic arm, or um, um, you can use the AI to assist the. So uh, in the recently, the, the AI is the quite popular. They can identify the heat compound from the known mechanism, uh, known mechanism or unknown mechanism. And then the, the, I should uh, point out, you also can study uh, by the rational design. As the Niraj said before, the, in this time, the, uh, when uh, we do uh, our team do have the, some three C protease the, the, uh, the experience the, during the, the SARS in the two thousand uh, uh, three, and then the, the quickly uh, our team member the, uh, Professor uh, Liang Bo Huang, uh, he found out the uh, uh, genome of the three C protease. The, uh, between the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-1 and the SARS-CoV-2, uh, they are the similar. So he quickly used the previous the discovery, the 3 c protease in the in SARS-CoV-1 to test the uh, 3 c SARS-CoV-2. So it, we found that it's the, uh, very uh, effective. And then uh, the, uh, once we have the compound, then uh, we go for the, the like the cell based assay, and and then uh, the, the, we uh, and then we go for the optimization lead. So you can see here the main consideration uh, we should consider the synthetic feasibility, uh, pattern territory, uh, try to build out the SAR and the SPR called the structure property relationship. And then the uh, goal uh, drug ability, normally we call a uh, drug-like property, consider uh, uh, maybe need to consider the uh, um, uh, basic uh, uh, the principle uh, rule of five. And then uh, you can build a call a uh, target product profile. You should know the, the how to uh, overcome the, the current, uh, current the, the compound. For example, if the rendezvous is good, 
and then how can we make the remdesivir the, the analog? So you should know the, uh, what's the uh, uh, pattern territory of the remdesivir or what's the weak point of the remdesivir to build up the, your own the target product profile. And then uh, once you have the optimized lead, or normally around the, uh, you have to synthesize more than 300 analog. And then uh, you know the SARSPR, and then you can file a pattern and then go for like the PK uh, drug metabolism, even the animal efficacy. And then uh, to select the, the best uh, uh, potential uh, compound, go for the uh, uh, development drug candidate. And then you go for the uh, scalp or know the, uh, the compound the polymorphism and then go for the preclinical development in, per, uh, in particular in the uh, tax and then, and then uh, normally by contract service go for the clinical trial. So in this stage you can go either industry collaboration and then technology transfer. So they uh, 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 um, right now is in from this procedure is the similar the, uh, is the new drug. But however, uh, you can see if you identify your compound from the old drug, that already in the either in clinical trial or in the market. So you don't need to go for the uh, hit to lead or lead, uh, lead to candidate optimization. You just identify your compound to, to test the positive in cell base and the in vivo or, or assay, and then you can go for the clinical trial. You don't even uh, go study the, uh, the preclinical development. So that's why the people like to use the old drug for new use, in particular in the emergency case. But however, uh, in this slide, they can show the, what's the advantage of the, uh, um, the new use the, for old drug. In, uh, normally in the target-based drug discovery, you will take it from the discovery to the market, it will take the 10 to 12 years and the cost of $1 billion. And then if, if you go to the drug report, uh, repurposing screen, like the, you already know the remdesivir well uh, effective uh, as the RDRP inhibitor uh, is the, uh, effective against the uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then the, you, you, you can do by yourself. Uh, normally it can take the two or three years and um, is uh, and cost the ten million dollars. But however, is once we have already know the target, we know the the remdesivir is as the RDRP. So you can use the RDRP as the target by repurpose screen. Normally it will take only four to six months and then and it's around uh, uh, hundred thousand dollars. So that is the quite quite uh, a cost effective. So why the people like to use the new use the uh, for old drug. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, recently in the ACS uh, Central Science uh, in March 12, they published a, a review paper. The title is uh, Research and the Development on Therapeutic Aging and the Vaccine for COVID-19 and the Related the Human Coronavirus Disease. So they list uh, a lot of the potential drug targets, 3C protease, uh, the RPS protein or trapped SS2, ACE2, AD2. So you can, and if you're interested, uh, you can um, download uh, uh, um, this paper for free. So, so right now, the, uh, um, my I, I, uh, experience in the um, uh, Rendezvous just the publishing their preliminary the, uh, uh, phase three, the result, it's look like they can improve the 31% and like the, from uh, um, 11 days, uh, from reduce the 15 days to the 11 days. In the, uh, so I think it's the, quite good. Um, however, it's not uh, for mortality, it's the, only the 8% versus the 11%, which they say is the, uh, non statistically. Uh, so, however, I believe the, 
uh, we should have like the combination use. Okay, if you can identify the 3C protease, you can combine the 3C protease uh, to RDRP inhibitor. So I believe the combination will be good for the uh, uh, for cure the uh, COVID nineteen. So that is the, my uh, my experience. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, in Academy Sinica, uh, we have like the open science the system. We welcome all the uh, international collaboration. We uh, we can do a lot of the. Uh, 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 we also have the blood sample, and we have the uh, number one the, the MP uh, MP protein for for testing, and then we also have the our own, own, own uh, antibody to to test. So I think it's the really good in the the uh, 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 research. Now. So I hope now we can have the, a lot of the collaboration between the Academic uh, uh, National Tsinghua University and uh, with the uh, uh, UPAS. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shea for explaining it in detail and how different approaches impact the cost as well as time uh, which is required to take a candidate to the market. So Dr. Shirisat, uh, your lab is also involved in drug discovery and uh, India has a big, uh, I would say, scientific uh, community. And still, uh, we usually are not that active, or we are not able to bring those molecules to the market. Mm. Uh, so since you are involved in drug discovery and uh, over the years you have been doing that, so can you share your experience and uh, what exactly is going on in drug discovery for COVID-19 in India? And uh, can we expect a molecule coming from India uh, for this disease. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neeraj. In fact, uh, thank you, Dr. Wang and uh, Sheikh uh, for uh, lucidly explaining the biology of virus first and then the potential mechanisms of actions. And in fact, uh, as we are talking about it, there are hundreds of research groups actually working on multiple approaches. Some of them have been prophylactic approaches and some of them are working for the treatment though. Uh, there are always a major two classes like the small molecules versus the, the, the vaccine approach. Uh, and the things are not uh, uh, really bad. I, I would say the things are very good. Uh, in fact, amongst the small molecules, uh, if you look at the repurposing options which are, which are coming up in a, in a rather uh, large numbers and those are the compounds which are uh, on the forefront of uh, clinical trials as on today including remdesivir which is the first one to to, to be approved for uh, um, critical cases uh, yesterday uh, for the patients uh, and then there are others uh, which are which are on the way but also as uh, dr wang said there are some de novo approaches coming up into the small molecules this is interesting because there are a lot of already known antiviral compounds into the literature, into the prior art literature, which have been tested uh, for the safety on the human beings. Now, those are the compounds which are coming up. Uh, and uh, best example, as, as we saw, was the remdesivir. Now, uh, when we talk about the contributions from India, uh, we know that there are at least seven of the global 40 uh, uh, efforts on uh, the vaccine are going on across the country in the various uh, national institutes. Although there are very few efforts which are going on in the small molecule. But uh, I believe, uh, uh, and it's a fact, that uh, India will have a very critical role uh, to play in the complete picture. Uh, what I mean to say here is actually, even when we talk about the small molecules, the chemistry cap capabilities of India are, are enormous. So the role that is being played right now uh, by various research centers in India, the contract research centers in India uh, is enormous in the preclinical drug discovery center. So as we speak, we are very proud to be uh, 
the part of multiple such uh, research works uh, uh, which are going on at uh, our research center for our partners of course and we 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 are very proud to be helping them across but uh, the discovery is one part of it and the development and the contribution to the manufacturing is another major part given the strength of indian chemical industry uh, known to the the final drug molecules in the larger quantities once they are identified that is a limitation as on today uh, even as we speak remdesivir uh, the innovators of remdesivir are uh, scouting across the globe for uh, for the manufacturing facilities and india is going to be one of them uh, as it is as it is visible so also is the pact for the vaccines now we we're talking about the vaccines and and the strategies that have been taken is not about only the inactivated viruses i do not see any approach there N neither the live attenuated viruses but the s protein uh, like uh, approaches uh, which are being taken for viruses uh, for the for the vaccine production uh, again where the things things will limit is one at identifying the vaccine at a very early stage and then the second one is to produce the vaccine in 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 enormous quantities to to provide for the whole global population now that's where that's where the capacity and the uh, you know scientific manpower of the uh, indian uh, pharmaceutical industry is going to play a huge role now as we speak uh, the, the the best and the most forefront uh, uh, vaccine uh, from oxford university and the jenner institute that we are talking about which is a single dose vaccine uh, having been tested in the rhesus monkeys for a single dose uh, and and rhesus monkeys have shown protection against it uh, something which is very positive about uh, we we see that uh, even in the public domain news that uh, there are uh, manufacturing uh, preparations happening right now uh, in the in across across india and one of the leading national institutes uh, is supporting the uh, large scale manufacturing of the vaccine at a very low at a very low cost and that i think is is the biggest contribution going to be from this country when it comes to the treatment of uh, the the covid 19 now as we speak uh, even if we talk about the prophylactic usage uh, medicines like chloroquine you talk about the hydroxy chloroquine or even the azithromycin like drug molecules which are which are thought to be the prophylactic ones and being actually used for the frontline workers uh, or the medical workers uh, across the globe uh, if if you look at the manufacturing capabilities in india uh, we are the ones which are uh, going to be able to supply the large quantities of these compounds even when it comes to the new molecules like remdesivir and then the bavipiravir like uh, compounds the chemistry capabilities will come up and i believe uh, the the vaccine efforts which are going across the country uh, some of them uh, would show some positive uh, results but uh, what what looks to be visible as on today uh, for the small molecules uh, remdesivir is already on the market and there could be couple of them in a in a span of few more months if the fda uh, takes uh, very aggressive stands on uh, moving these things forward uh, but when it comes to the vaccine i do not see anything uh, in the in the site for at least 7 uh, to 8 eight, uh, eight months from now uh, dr neeraj um thank you dr shivasat and uh, i think uh, at least uh, there's a lot of effort also going on on the this new Uh, produce uh, mass production of these drugs so i think india would really play as you mentioned a big role in that uh, especially remdesivir uh, and there are many other antivirals with and uh, hydroxychloroquine um, yeah. we were uh, we are the largest producers in uh, supplying this drug to uh, across the world although uh, it's still questionable how effective that drug is yes and uh, so before i move to koshik 
Dr. Wang, uh, I'll address one question more to you. What are the facilities you need to screen uh, drugs for, say, uh, such an infectious disease like uh, COVID-19? So it's, it's so infectious, the virus. That, uh, maybe you cannot really work on it in a regular lab. So what are the facilities which you need so that you can um, do things safely and also you are not putting others at risk? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so like Mira just said, um, in principle, this virus is, should be conducted in a P3, biosafety P3 lab, which is not uh, supported in many universities. Mm. So we have to develop specific assay to mimic uh, individual pathways uh, during the viral infection. Um, for example, if we would like to develop uh, the assay that is currently developed in my lab is to mimic the attachment between virus spike protein and uh, um, the ACE2 receptor. So in principle, we have to um, have the cell line facility overexpress the host receptor, then maybe reproduce a recombinant virus spike protein. And with a little, a little bit epigenetic, uh, a, a genetic modification that allow us to monitor the attachment in real time by enzymatic assay, fluorescence assay, or any other type of assay. So in principle, we have to dissect individual uh, virus life cycles and uh, uh, translate this small, small process in, in, into the lab. And just taking another example, which is um, um, Randasvir, inhibiting the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Just yesterday, the a paper published in Science already have the new is the Randasvir and a RNA template. So with that, uh, you can already do to, to take marking. And then it is also possible to develop an enzyme assay in the lab. This all, this does not need a P3 lab. So a conventional uh, biology lab can do it, okay? So in principle, we have to know the target. We have to know the process, and then we have to design a proper assay that could support large-scale screening. Because at this stage, we simply have no idea what kind of compound can inhibit a specific enzymatic pathway. So the more compound scientists could screen, the better chance we will find a solution. Yeah. So I think that's my answer yes, for the thank assay. You. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for clearly explaining it. And uh, also, I, uh, yeah, I don't can add you know, one more for in particular, uh, in particular uh, uh, cell based ACE. Um, uh, during the SARS in 2003, after I, I was after the uh, SARS, and, uh, I, as I know they are around more than 15 the P3 lab. However, in the past uh, uh, 15 years, uh, nobody used uh, the P3 uh, lab. And then uh, is, uh, you have to if, uh, um, make uh, a lot of the, uh, effort to maintain the, the P3 lab. So, so a lot of the university could not the, the provide uh, this kind of luxury the support. So, so this time, uh, it's even in Taiwan, only in the three to four lab, and the uh, the P three lab that can can be uh, functional. Okay, so oh, uh, as in one of the uh, the first in the in the 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 P three lab the, to I, uh, isolate the 
the, the virus is the National Taiwan University. He, he, so my friend in, in uh, National Taiwan University, she isolate, uh, she is the first uh, uh, professor to isolate the, the virus and then the, to build up the, the cell-based assay. So that is uh, quite quite uh, um, quite dangerous the effort. I asked her. Uh, she told me that normally you will. Uh, she only can take maybe twelve compound per uh, per week. So it's it's not like the the high school pools who mm. ace. It. So so it's it's quite dangerous. Now. So because you will have the, a lot of the pressure the, to run the, uh, to to run the experiment. And uh, that adds to the cost also. So as you are mentioning, 12 yeah. compounds a week. So th that is adding the cost of drug discovery. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Dr. Shet. And so now so moving Dr. On Neeraj, to uh, Dr. Yeah. Neeraj, I had a small question for Dr. Shea and Dr. Wong being a, a virologist. Uh, I wanted to ask you, like, why are there no attempts being made for attenuated virus? as one vaccine approach or for example challenging the immune system a, a very age-old technique probably the one which was the oldest one is to challenge the larger animals like horse collect the plasma and use the antibodies uh, against uh, uh, you know as the as the uh, vaccine approach why why are these approaches uh, not seen uh, prevalent uh, in this situation which which appear to be actually the fastest ones um maybe i can answer this question yes so please, um for using the attenuated virus um you have the major concern is the biosafety so mm. the term attenuation indicating that the virus is still infectious it only caused mild disease right. we i don't think we know um enough about this virus so it is probably too early to make any virus attenuated and you have to totally understand all the virulence vector and the disease causing factor of the, this virus so you can avoid those potential um, risk when you're using an attenuated virus and on the other hand if there are already different vaccine approaches using either a recombinant protein, RNA, nucleic acid, nanoparticles, even viral-like particles. So those probably on um, the biosafety concern may be more, uh, much better options than attenuated virus. But I guess maybe if there is a specific nice strain that could protect, offer protectivity while does not making uh, strong symptoms. Maybe that one could also work for vaccine. Yeah, but I highly doubt it that attenuated virus will be used for COVID nineteen since we already have plenty of choices for the moment. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Wang. And um, so now, Koshik, moving to you. So we we are looking for a quick fix. So. Uh, we cannot wait for say no. a year, two years, or uh, five years to get a drug. We are a uh, whole world is in distress. We are locked down. Um, you remember one of the famous dialogues from uh, Hindi movies, uh, a mosquito can <laughs> really change you. <laughs> so the, the virus has uh, locked down across you know, people across the world. So we are, uh, say, locked down in the homes. All the businesses are closed. Universities, almost everything is closed, especially in India. And maybe Taiwan recovered very fast and they could control it really well. But uh, what do you think the strategy should be for such diseases? Yeah. Uh, so this is not the only outbreak we'll be having. We already had SARS, MERS, Ebola, so many others. But of mm -hmm. course, the respiratory diseases are much more infectious, much more dangerous. So uh, wearing both the hats of uh, uh, business strategist and uh, chemist, 
uh, what do you think should the strategy should be? Yeah, I think that's a very pertinent question, Niraj. Uh, wish all of us in this panel had some answer to this. But what I'm going to do is, you know, I can see some of the questions from some of the participants. You know, yeah. uh, you know, some of us are looking at uh, this as a total failure of the system to bring quick solutions and things like that. Mm. You know, what I want everybody to remember: when did we get to know about this disease? December end. Maybe from January we started to know, yeah. and today we are on second May. And look at the improvement that has happened. It's unbelievable. According to me, I believe all of us will agree the amount of movement that is happening, we have not seen this in recent times in the recent history. You know, normally for a vaccine to come into being in a normal process, it's 10 years. And in some case, when it was expedited, it was around five years. But now, within a few months, we are testing probably around eight vaccines, human trial approved eight, including one from Oxford, one from US in a totally new technology. I think it was on mRNA technology from a company in US. So I think we all understand, you know, all the economy is stalled, all our livelihoods are at stake. So there is a huge pressure for everybody to come back to normalcy. But unfortunately, as uh, Lily showed us, RO value, the rate of transmission is something that really doesn't allow us to, you know, dismantle whatever we have achieved so far using social distancing. You know, typically from one person within one month, 406 people can get infected. Now think about each of those 406 people, how many of them are infecting how many of people. And as we know for India especially, there are many cases, especially in Mumbai, there is a data in Maharashtra, for example, 80% of people are asymptotic, which is even a very scary proposition. But if we look at the big picture, you know, there are a few things that are coming out. Number one, public health infrastructure. Look at the countries. Okay, another thing that I'm going to mention right in the beginning, one of the questions that, is, that has come from one of the participants, you know, when you look at the mortality rate, when you look at the number of people died, don't look at just as an isolated number. Look at it from per capita. How many people have died per 100,000, you know, people? So if you look at Europe, the highest number, or in the whole world, the highest number, you may not believe, is from Belgium. Then second comes Spain, then comes Italy. Wow. US, in spite of 64,000, so U.S. the death is around 64,000, right? But U.S. per capita death is, you know, around 198.58. So that is 198.58 people out of 100,000, they are dying. And Belgium, that number is 674.4. And for U.K., that number is 413. So I think many times we look at these absolute numbers. And we also look at, you know, number of infections, then we get, you know, all ballistic, oh, nothing is under control. No, that's not the case. The number of cases that is reported positive, may, most of the times they're dependent on the number of tests that are conducted. How many of those tests are reliable really? And so mm -hmm. that's why it's very important to understand the numbers, not in the absolute term, but in a relative terminology. So anybody can go to, there, are, there is a, very good site for statistics, 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 I think. So that gives a lot of input of this kind of statistics. So please look at this figure. Now, coming back to this, there are a few things that are emerging out from this. Number one is public health infrastructure. Look at the example of Taiwan. Look at the example of South Korea. Look at the example of Singapore. I'm really happy that all three countries are in Asia. And then look at the example of Germany. You know, this is unbelievable how Taiwan and Singapore and South Korea, they contained the whole thing. What they did, testing and triaging. But how did they set up this mechanism? This is something we all need to understand. They first set up one epidemic. But what they did, all they did to do is to reactivate the system. Just 10 million tests. 
if you are feeling unwell just pick up the phone and somebody will come to your home and take the swab in within half an hour and within two days you get your results now look at the problem here the country like us is such a rich country from innovation perspective but look at the public health infrastructure then similar example one though it's slightly better in uk though there is a beautiful national health system but then this pandemic response this you know response to this kind of disaster is not Foreseen. And what happened in 2016, for example, in U UK, there was a dummy run of this kind of pandemic, how the system is uh, ready for facing it, and then they realized they were not ready. But what South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore could do, none of these countries could do. They could not activate that system, even if they knew things were not in the right place. And for Germany, for example, there is another thing with this. So with public health infrastructure and preparedness for pandemic, I want to quickly touch upon the Indian scenario. You know, India is one of the countries which went to lockdown really early. But what is bothering me, this is something I think Vikas and Niraj also can, you know, support or, you know, counter me if I'm not uh, on the right track. I think the number of testing, per capita testing is not going up the way it should go with the amount of population that we are having in India. So what is happening in India, number one, we are not testing in PCR, which is the most reliable one. Many times we are using kits, those so-called antigen antibody kits, which many times are not very reliable. You know, ICMR approved a lot of those things. Now they had to withdraw those approval, you know, within two days. So I think for or country like India, you know, we have opportunity with the lockdown. I would say with the type of demography we have, we had a wonderful lockdown. But if we can ramp up the testing to support this, I think that will be one of the case studies in you know, public health history in India. So time will tell whether we have missed the opportunity or we are on the right track. So keeping our fingers crossed that something, everything happens in the right way. Now, other thing here, all of you have probably noticed when a global pandemic at this scale happens, it needs collaboration. Mm. It cannot be managed by one single country. Now, what we are seeing here with the present global scenario, if you look at the political spectrum, we have geopolitical interest. One country does not like another country in their neighborhood. Then there are leadership who are highly nationalists and populists, who are anti-globalists. So what is happening in this process you know, we have a forum, platform, who, health organization. See, nothing is ideal. Let's not, let's not even believe that things will be ideal. But a, there is a forum which can bring things together, all the knowledge base together, all the pandemic response together. Then we have other forums like G7, G20, then we have United Nations. But what we are seeing here, when there is a global level crisis, the crisis management is not happening at global level. You know, in many hotspots, we are seeing one country is kind of trying to ramp up their populist agenda and they are going against another country. This is not going to help us. I think this is a big learning from a strategy point of view. We can see that a global pandemic needs a global collaboration. It needs way beyond this kind of country specific interest. Then comes another very important thing that we have been observing is that socioeconomic chasm. You know, this is something we knew about it, we never bothered about it. Look at the case of Singapore. Singapore almost, you know, the infection rate almost went down to zero, but suddenly there was a huge spike. Where did it come from? It came from that migrant population who are literally packed like tinned sardines in those dormitories. And these are the, all the migrants coming from, you know, India, Bangladesh, or other countries. Now, again, the news today is, as soon as that came out, Singapore, thanks to their effective public health system, they could immediately segregate them. They could do that testing and triaging again, coming back to same testing and triaging. Now, Singapore has again, you know, relaxed the lockdown because things have improved. So I think Singapore is a very good example which shows, but then look at the other side, look at UK. Yesterday, the report came in UK, there is a huge mortality rate among ethnic minorities, which includes black Africans, black Caribbeans, Indians, Bangladeshis, and Pakistanis. For black Africans, the mortality rate is 3.9 times than white population. 
for Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, it's coming to around two point something. Now look at frontline workers. Many of them live in a very congested area. So then there is another type of study which is going on, which is connecting air pollution to mortality. But then the interesting thing here, again, I would like people to be very careful in taking this data at its face value. Look at India. We have highly congested places. We have hugely polluted cities, but then whatever be the case, mortality rate in India is not as high as many of these so-called developed nations. So there is something beyond that. So I think that's why it is very important when there is a pandemic like this, when everybody is looking for an answer, many times we fall for the answers which may not be the right answer. Okay. So now from this big picture, let us come to the innovation component. You know, what Vikas just now mentioned that Dr. Shea or, you know, Dr. Wang, when they are talking about innovation, see, I think the very important thing we need to understand is the national innovation system. Many times when we talk about innovation, we talk about one organization. But you know, all of us is part of a system. It's called national innovation system. What is the governmental policy? How government supports your innovation? Today, if Jubilant came to with a wonderful molecule, you know, I was lucky to be part of a wonderful molecule, but then we all know for a clinical trial, you'll be looking for funding. I mean, that's a reality. In India, some of us who tried to do drug discovery, we saw that happening. And now, this is where I think for Indian perspective, and if you compare that with Taiwan, you can see a very different story. There is a stronger innovation infrastructure. Look at the global innovation index. Taiwan is way higher. US, UK, or Sweden, these are the countries that are way higher than India. And there is a reason for that. There is no dust of talent. This is something people many times make a mistake. There is no dust of talent, but that whole microsome, microcosm of innovation that probably needs to be revisited. I think a country like India with so many beautiful academic institutes, so many organizations like Jubiland, Glenmark, Biocon, you know, we should be sitting on innovation, you know, pipeline. But what is happening here, probably we are missing that plot somewhere, the connectivity, how industry and academia can work together and how innovation can move forward. I think this is where I can see when I saw Dr. Shea's slide, I could see how some of these things will be very beneficial from Indian context. You know, there is no lack of possibility. And so I think from, and that's why if you see today, whatever drug discovery we are talking about in COVID, you know, they are all coming from Western part of the world. You know, that's a reality, you know, or coming from say, Taiwan or, yeah. So that's where we are. So Vikas, yes, or Niraj? Yeah, yeah, Kaushik, you made uh, some really very important points like why and how we could contain as India uh, being very crowded places, larger cities, uh, yeah. and and you, you have everything that is, uh, uh, you know, against, uh, you know, control. You know, it should have spread uh, yeah. exponentially so far. I, we, we must see uh, the, the difference in the social behaviors and the compliant behavior that the Indians have on one side uh, when it comes to addressing to the national national needs. Uh, the, in spite of the huge divide uh, and, the, and the huge socioeconomic gap, uh, we see that there are good responses in all the uh, classes of society. For example, I would say, I'm, I've never heard of a single case of uh, hoarding of, uh, you know, things in India. Uh, and, and when somebody went to, to buy, they, they were out of stock. Like, we have heard of these stories from the Western world, for example. Okay, so there are some pluses and there are some minuses. And when it comes to, to, to the, uh, say, for example, the contribution of government, uh, the academia and the industry collaboration, things are changing rapidly. And I believe things will be much better going yep. forward as we speak. In fact, uh, I was myself surprised that uh, uh, the 
Pune based uh, uh, biotechnology institute, uh, one of the national biotechnology institutes, which is an academic institute. It has the largest manufacturing capability mm -hmm. for vaccines, mm -hmm. the Serum, yeah, Serum institute, institute of India. And, and that is something uh, which even, even was a news to me uh, last week. So we have we have no less yep. uh, facilities, no lack of talent, as you <laughs> rightly said, uh, and I think the things will turn in the right direction. Yeah, because uh, whereas it comes uh, when it comes to innovation, uh, the point of view that you presented is largely valid, Kaushik, and and we need a lot to change there. Yeah, because uh, yes, uh, and Kaushik, thank you. Uh, so I think uh, now we need to move to the questions and i think kaushik did address some of them uh, during his uh, uh, the, the, when he addressed uh, the panel so, so Virat, before you start from all the questions can i just answer one okay number uh, one yeah, definitely as i mentioned in the beginning this has just come into picture in january so whenever we talk about timeline why things are not happening first guys things are happening at a lightning speed i think all of us in this panel and many of you who are participating and experienced drug discovery things are happening at light, lightning speed clinical trial yes there are a lot of cutting the steps that is happening a lot of steps are getting truncated uh, phase one phase two be getting merged that is number one number two this is something though i don't see any question here but i am going to say it again and again please 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 don't believe in the fake news that is circulating in social media i mean that is something i'm finding to be the biggest challenge in addressing these things so there is a new university which is called whatsapp university so my request to all of these participants please 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 stay away from that okay scientists <laughs> are working they're working over time 24 7 365 days Today, Vikas is in Jubilant facility. They are working overnight, over time. So everybody is working. So please trust the scientists. Don't listen to the fake pseudo-scientific reports. That's it. Sorry. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. And I think that is loud and clear. Uh, and uh, I think that's a message which really needs to go across. And uh, so, uh, Dr. Wang, I'll again, Come back to you. There are a lot of questions regarding the mutation hmm. of COVID-19. So, how many types of uh, SARS-CoV-2 are we uh, looking at? So, there are different mutated versions. And uh, would the drugs, say Remdesivir, would be would it be effective against all the versions? Um, for the first question, how many type of coronavirus? Um, in principle, let me, let me just see if I can share the screen. Okay. Can you see it? Okay, so based on the sequence homology, they, you can classify the coronavirus into alpha genus, beta genus, and gamma genus. And not all coronavirus causing disease, only a few causing disease. That including the alpha genus, like NL63, or the major beta genus, which is the SARS coronavirus and COVID-2. Okay, and it depends on whether the spike protein could bind attached to a specific host receptor. So there are several different types of SARS coronavirus, but not, not all of them causing disease. And then, the, um, and then, Speaking to um, the mutations, right? Um, I really cannot say much about it because there are tremendous of different mutations um, have been discovered around the world. And the reason of that is because the viral replication depends on a key enzyme, uh, which I have showed, which is RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And this is a enzyme with low fidelities. So it ten, it's an aeropone replication during virus, virus reproduction. Okay, so um, in principle, RNA virus are tend to make mutants. 
but there are reports claim, saying that there is a um, proofreaders encoded by the virus. So the mutation rate is actually uh, lower than expected. But nevertheless, the mutation occurs, um, can occur anywhere in, on the genome. So if you ask me, my own opinion would be we are going to need a lot of different antiviral drugs to fight against the disease because such virus might easily developing drug resistant mutant. Taking remdesivir as an example, its crystal structure fit with the RDRB has been characterized, right? And it only fit with a tiny active pocket in the RDRP. So if any of the mu any of the amino acid has been changed of the virus, the RDIP may, may remain active in RNA replication, while the remdesivir may no longer able to inhibit such enzyme. So I would say that we are probably going to need a different drugs, or at least like, uh, because they will probably need a combination treatment. Or Dr. She mentioned that we are, we are going to need a different approach de to develop a lot of drugs um, to fight against this disease. So yes, remdesivir looks promising right now, but I would say in the long run, we still need much more options for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. So next question, uh, uh, either Dr. She or Vikas, either of you can answer. So are there any leads coming from the plants also? So in India uh, and in China also, a lot of uh, plant-based drugs are used. And uh, even the isolates from these uh, phytoconstituents of these plant-based drugs. So are there any leads coming from uh, these plants? And uh, a related question is regarding the role of theophylline or theobromine, uh, as well as methylxanthines against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Shea, you would, you would like to start and I can compliment. Um, maybe you can go first, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Neeraj, uh, as, as we are speaking, and again, I have to refer to the WhatsApp university that uh, <laughs> uh, Kaushik uh, mentioned. There are uh, multiple potential therapies which are being talked about in the alternative medicine. And that, that, that includes uh, the homeopathic uh, system and the natural products which, which can contribute. Now, when we talk about the small molecule solutions to, to, the, to the COVID alone, uh, there have been enormous examples in the past that there have been real complex molecules which could, which could actually work uh, either by the nuclear mechanisms or the cellular mechanisms against uh, cancer and uh, bacterial and uh, viral uh, systems. So one approach could be to validate the existing uh, therapies which are, which are known. Uh, and the other one could be using these uh, natural libraries to screen uh, for the new, new hits or the leads. Now, as we speak, there are there are some examples like there are, there is like uh, there are some molecules that I see some of the uh, compounds from the natural products which are being prescribed. That this that that is a controversial area because of the lack of the clinical trials and all of that. But the fact of the matter is the complex natural products uh, can be a really good uh, uh, solution. Uh, to the small molecule uh, treatments that we are looking for. There could be a solution there. Okay. Um, uh, uh, as you can see uh, uh, my screen, uh, my colleague, the uh, Dr. Li Xiu from NHI, she identified a uh, uh, telephoning compound from some some um, uh, nature or product. I think that the people in India maybe know about the telephoning. 
So she published a paper uh, in the 2010 um, on the antiviral research. So she identified the uh, phenylalanine and the phenylalanine as the novel potential anti-coronavirus agent. So currently, the, uh, uh, they are testing the uh, tenofovir compound against the co uh, uh, COVID-19. So I believe then, uh, they will publish the paper in the, uh, soon. Okay. Thank you, Dr. She and Davikas. Uh, so Dr. Wang, your mic is on mute. Uh, I have yeah. one question for Vikas. You just mentioned the natural products. Oh, that could be a, um, might be helpful. I want to ask because we are discussing the drug discovery and most of us are focusing on thinking about to cure or to treat patients upon infection. I'm wondering maybe also Kashuk also can comment on it. Is it possible to develop a drug as prophylaxis use? So you, receive some drugs to prevent potential infection, especially for the first line medical um, workers that might be helpful because they are high risk exposures. I don't know if there are any specific. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Wang, as I said, uh, although this area is is a bit controversial because of the lack of the clinical trial. In the traditional system of medicine and alternative medicines like Ayurveda, there are certainly some of the uh, extracts known which, which can be preventive for viral infections, which are known, which are very well documented. And there are people who practice uh, using these uh, extracts. Uh, some of them are simply use of some leaves uh, on regular basis, which which, uh, which leads to a long-term immunity yeah. against some of the viral infections. And this is, th there is enough data about that. Uh, however, the question is how to go about nailing down the active principle, for example, and then put it onto the market, either for prophylaxis or for the treatment. I believe, I believe, that there are multiple complex motifs in the natural systems which cannot be comprehended by human mind for synthesis, for example. You cannot achieve the complexity of the, of, of the nature uh, into the laboratory. And that itself is a solution to the large part of the problem. When I see now, right now, when I reviewed some of the articles where the repurposing attempts are being made, uh, you see most of the multi-chiral motifs which are available in the literature, these are the prior art molecules, which are very much closer to the natural product molecules. Mm. They were being developed for multiple other therapies, but then they have been in vitro very active against the coronavirus. Now, they are quite, quite far from development even now because they are not even in the clinic right mm. now. But, but that, that said, uh, natural products do have a high level of uh, potential here. Uh, and I, I, I would leave uh, some of the part to Kaushik to address uh, as a medicinal chemist. Oh, well, thank you for remembering that <laughs> anyway. So I think, I think, I think because you are so right, I think uh, you are absolutely nailed it at the, you know, at the head. See, natural, and, and, you know, those of you who know Nidaj's background, he's also an expert in, you know, isolating natural products. So, you know, using all kinds of fancy methods. But as all of us will probably agree, you know, first of all, as I'm talking about India innovation, I'm quite passionate about it. I believe India has a very distinct innovation in drugs based on natural products. Himalaya is, uh, is an amazing place for biodiversity. And so I think India, I mean, I would urge Vikas really to look into it because you are, you know, at a decision-making uh, position. And I think this is something, one area which I believe we can really make ourselves the world leader. That is number one. Number two, the biggest challenge that I'm observing, that is my experience. When I was working for a multinational uh, Swedish company, uh, we were thinking of doing a high throughput screening of a library of natural product extracts that was available with an Indian company. 
you know, we almost went ahead. We almost were, you know, about to finalize the protocol. But then the typical Western mind asked the very simple question, do we know the identification of at least 60% of those compounds in that extract? Or these are just randomly collected extracts? As soon as that question is asked, everything falls to the crack. Now let's assume without being, you know, coming from a Western background, we do a screening, we find a good hit from an extract mix, but then how do we identify the active ingredient? And as all of us know many times, when we identify what we think to be the active ingredient, either that doesn't show activity or metabolic profile is so bad you cannot really convert that to a drug and put it even in an animal. It will undergo microsomal degradation right then and there. So there is something that happens in natural environment, which so far has been found to be very difficult to replicate. But again, I think this is where I believe in India, we have a huge potential. The amount of biodiversity that we have in India, and if you look at the earlier days, Shushrut was you know, the doctor, for India, for the whole world at that time. And Chadak, you know, so these are the medicines people have been using for ages. And I agree with because even for homeopathy, there is a prophylactic action for many of, you know, I remember in my childhood days, during the smallpox season, the homeopathic doctor will give some medicine that, okay, you take it, you will be protected from smallpox or chickenpox for that purpose. And those of you who don't know, Prince Charles got coronavirus infection recently. He was in Edinburgh in Scotland. And the royal family is a big fan of homeopathic medicine. <laughs> and he got treated by homeopathic medicine. He got treated when by self -quarantine. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, exactly. Probably. Exactly. But but the fact of the matter is I think just because we don't understand the whole clinical part of this, I don't think any of us are in a position to denounce it. I think this really needs more careful looking and somehow I strongly believe Ayurveda is one area which is probably quite a bit ignored. I mean, this could do, this could benefit from more systematic analysis. Yeah. Thank you, Kaushik and uh, Vikas. Uh, so one question which uh, before we come to the last one and that uh, uh, I'll address to Dr. Wang that would be related to whether it's natural or man-made. But before that, I, I would like to ask maybe Dr. She, Kaushik and uh, Vikas. And uh, since uh, I am in a university in an academic environment, in India, we rarely see that uh, collaboration, and I think Kaushik had mentioned regarding collaboration when he was talking really see that collaboration between academia and industry. While if you go to a lot of other countries, you see that connect between the academia and industry to work on such problems. What do you think we are missing in India and how can we bring these two important components together? And maybe Dr. Che, you can also uh, add to it. What makes these uh, collaborations work and why do we miss those uh, in India? Uh, first of all, uh, recently I discussed with uh, uh, um, the top person in government. I told, I, I told him that the, if we do not have like, if uh, 15, year, uh, uh, 15 years ago, if you know, we do not uh, uh, invest uh, the uh, research on, uh, on SARS, uh, we don't have uh, anything in right now that uh, we are well behind. But however, uh, currently we do have uh, some 3C proteins in the uh, inhibitor which derived uh, from uh, 15 years ago and also as well as uh, we do uh, we we do have uh, the uh, the antibody uh, against the SARS in the, the 15 years old. they found out in some refrigerator and then uh, they bring out and uh, test the uh, COVID-19 they found out oh it's effective so they <laughs> don't start uh, from the scratch 
So, mm-hmm. and then also, uh, uh, I, oh, I, I also saw one um, uh, assistant professor in, uh, in Academy Seneca at that time. Uh, he was the, the PhD student work on the, 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 the SARS project. And after that, uh, she grew up and then uh, have the many experiences. So I think that uh, we have to uh, uh, invest the, our young scientists. The, and then also I do agree that the Niraj, in the, we should make the uh, academy and the industry so closely. So that's why uh, I'm currently the view, uh, we are, are focused on the, how to do the translation research. It means that we want to bring the industry partner as early as uh, possible. So because the, uh, in industry, in the, they have the some um, different view, okay? So they can and encourage you know, our, our scientists you know, in that lab, you know, open their angle, not just focus on the, some, uh, something, but you should have expand and your view. I think the, the, uh, yeah, will be good. I think after the collaboration between the academia and the industry, are very very important. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, because uh, Dr. Neeraj, it's a it's a long question, and all along my career, uh, I've been the part of this discussion from one side or the other. Uh, why not industry academia collaboration uh, in India and why it doesn't work? I mean, uh, we will not talk about the social aspects of it. But if we look at Eastern as well as, you know, places with respect to India, where the academia plays a central role uh, and then the industry latches onto it or the academia actually gives birth to the industry mm-hmm. and there are spin-outs. What happens there is the concept level research actually happens, which, which could be applicable. So the applied or applicable concept level research being conducted in a, in a university or an academic setup is something which you now look at what is happening in India, I mean, there are, of course, a lot of uh, exceptions, but what happens in India typically is the academic institutions are busy with academic research and not potential industrially applicable research. Yeah. And there is a certain difference in the mindset uh, we, we, which, which needs to be changed. Now, it's, it's not only on the side of academia, but also on the side of industry. Yeah. So, industry also has a role to 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 incubate uh, certain uh, groups uh, and the talent in the academia to motivate them, to fund them uh, if needed, uh, and to groom this ecosystem to come to the maturity. If you don't start early, it, it will be too late. As Dr. Shea said, uh, it takes years, probably 50 years to mature to the, to the kind of ecosystem that we are, we are thinking about. Uh, you know, say for example, what happens in in, in the West and in the, in the Cambridge or the uh, you know East Coast or other other uh, hotspots. I think I think there is something needs to be done from both the sides, and uh, uh, this is also a partly probably a cultural uh, angle to it, uh, which, which could be a could be a hindrance, I believe. Uh, I do know a lot of uh, collaborations. Industry often runs to the academia when it comes to solving the problems rather quickly, uh, and, and they do get the help. There is a section of industry in India which immensely is supported by academia, but it's not the innovation of the drugs, uh, which is which is what we are talking about. When it comes to manufacturing, for example, uh, manufacturing of the chemical industry, for example. Yeah, there is a there is a certain level of collaboration which is which is very good, which is healthy. But in innovation, we 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 have a long way to go. Actually, 
Yeah, Kaushik. Yeah, Kaushik. <laughs> well, because you know this alludes to what I said some time back: national innovation system. Mm -hmm. you know this is a high level policy decision plus industry environment institutional environment but because what you are saying i think we have discussed probably this topic many many hours together in your office but the thing is what you said just now is very important look at process chemistry look at manufacturing look at even vaccine manufacturing yes. india is at the top position look at generic drug india is world leader no doubt about it so this is where i you know thanks to my now management background i can draw your attention to the value chain what is the value chain how you are creating value for your organization through the steps that you do in drug discovery where is the main value what vikas just now mentioned in the innovation in the discovery part and then comes manufacturing then comes marketing and brand management now look at the value chain for india for indian industry the industry leaders they are very happy to occupy the lower part of the value chain which is manufactured and this is the mindset which hurts when we try to bring innovation because if you are doing a manufacturing you just do something you get the return on investment next day but when we are talking about creating innovation the return on investment may come after 10 years but i think that mindset from industry point of view needs to change but then again that can be supported by governmental policy if you look at western countries there is lot of support from government side to support this kind of incubators you know even for taiwan south korea even china has made lot of stride in that and this you can see by looking at the publication at top ranking journals which we consider to be the innovation pioneer journals you know like be it nature be it science you will see more publication from these are the countries where you can see more publication so i think that as vikas rightly said it comes from both the sides maybe upes and jubilant can come together and set a trend <laughs> i am waiting to see that <laughs> yes yes we have we had had a lot of discussion with industry and uh, um since vikas is also member of our advisory board and um, i can vikas can uh, maybe uh, uh, add to what i am saying uh, we had a very productive advisory board meeting this january and there were a lot of things like this which were discussed and how we should go forward in say creating this uh, industry academia uh, relationship which will benefit not only students but also the society and industry so now coming to the last question we are already uh, quite uh, uh, around i think 11 minutes uh, over the time but this is something i think which is being uh, discussed across the world so dr wang is yeah. has covid to a natural virus or a man made virus <laughs> um i cannot answer this question but i can address the question by another way so the question is whether me as a very good virologist can i make such virus by myself mm -hmm. okay and my answer is probably not or very difficult and uh, i'm going to explain my reason okay so this is the genome structure of sars-cov-2 and the viral genome contains 30 kilobase pairs right and everybody is concerning that um there are some sequence homology similar to a man-made specific structure and uh, but if you're looking at the nucleotide identity between SARS-CoV-2 of course it it most likely like the bat origin of red are ATG13 this one specific variant and it, it does not look very much like the other coronavirus okay so if one virologist would like to create such specific virus he or she will have to generate the whole sequence from nowhere 
which is I think it's highly difficult to do that. Okay, so if you ask me is whether impossible, I Dr. Wang. Huh? I, 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 I heard it is highly, highly difficult, but is it impossible? Yeah, for me it's impossible, but maybe for others I don't know. So I think it's very difficult. If you claim it's man-made, it's based on pieces of evidence. If you look into the whole genome sequence, there are many, many, many different um, um, sequences that are not aligned with any conventional, any known viruses. So um, it's not like a assemble or pieces of sequence into a whole, in, into a brand new virus. It's like a brand new one for me, okay? So, but of course, if there are any genius virus could do such thing, of course, they can make such contagious virus. But I just think it's very difficult to make such virus from nowhere, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Um, yeah. That's my for personal throwing light opinion. on this, and uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Dr. Che, Vikas, Kaushik, um, Dr. Wang. It was, I think, a really interesting discussion, and uh, I hope uh, the participants uh, really enjoyed it and uh, learned a lot of new things from this discussion. I again thank you all for taking time out to be part of this discussion, and uh, we'll be looking for more such discussions in future. Thanks everyone for joining and uh, uh, please stay home, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you I everyone. I would like to make a small announcement. I'm sorry, just two minutes. Yes, yes, Dr. Wang. My lab is currently developing an anti-spike ACE2 functional assay. Mm. So we get it done already. So if any one of you have potential compound that would like to test whether it can be worked as an entry inhibitor. You are welcome to send those compounds to my lab. I will give it oh, a wonderful. test. Okay, so I have two functional tests that I could use to test as an entry inhibitor, which is not available on the market or on the literature. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Thank I you. think that, that would be uh, really good for a lot of researchers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for joining and uh, let us meet again soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Be safe.